when we talk about electronics and electrical devices, the thing that's on our minds most is energy. How do they use energy? How do they transform it into useful work? And something I bet you know is related to that is a concept called voltage. You've probably heard of high voltage. You probably know that various power supplies have different voltages. You may be aware that different countries supply electricity with different voltages. And I want to make sure we understand what that means. The real physics word for voltage is electrical potential which sounds a lot like electrical potential energy, but it's slightly different. Voltage is the potential energy per charge. Depending on what class you're in, you write, might write it as PE over Q or U over Q. So why would we care about the potential energy that each charge carries as it moves through a circuit? That's what this video aims to explain. We're first going to look at the various voltages that you might encounter in your everyday life. We're then going to try to define this and explain why it's important. So here's some various batteries. And it's informative to look at the different types. The 9 volt battery clearly has 9 volts. But the other two, the D and the AAA, I don't know if you've ever looked at them, but they actually have the same voltage, 1.5. And that means electrically, they're very similar, although um, you use them in pretty different applications. So the D, we usually use in devices that uh, use a lot of energy and can run batteries down quick. The AAA we usually use in, in fairly long-lived devices that don't use energy very quickly. But they would be interchangeable. We could wire them in into each other's devices and they would at least turn the thing on. The 9 volt's pretty different. The reason for these differences has to do with the chemistry inside the batteries and that's something we'll look at in a later lesson. Car batteries have a voltage of 12 volts which has to do with their particular chemistry. As you can see they have lead in them and that's different than the batteries we saw in the classroom and we'll see that that gives them a different voltage. These two alarm clocks are very similar and they have almost the same electrical requirements. But this one came from the UK, this one came from the US. And as we can see, their plugs are very different. And that has to do with the fact that those two countries supply different voltages to their devices. If we look at the British clock, we can see it expects to receive between 230 and 240 volts. And the American clock expects to receive 120. So we'll have to go through the reasons why countries use different um, electrical power supplies and the consequences that they have for um, how the devices work. My British clock is not going to work on an American circuit if I don't find some way to transform the voltage that comes out of our electrical outlets into something that can supply this clock. This device here will do that. This part changes the, the pins so that they match American style outlets. And this part here is called a transformer. And as we can see, it actually changes an input 110 voltage into an output 220 volts. And that's enough to make that clock work. So we'll have to talk about how we convert voltages. Our Van de Graaff generators routinely generate 200,000 to 300,000 volts. So you'd think they are very high energy devices. But they're not, as you saw in previous videos, I was willing to shock myself with them. So this difference between energy and voltage is very important. 300,000 volts sounds dangerous, but it wasn't enough energy to hurt me. So we're going to have to figure out that distinction. So let's take a look. So I've got over here a 9 volt battery. It's got a positive terminal and a negative terminal. And what that means is that at the negative terminal, a chemical reaction is happening that donates electrons. The positive, there's one that's consuming electrons. I'll hook them up to a light bulb. A light bulb is just a coil of wire. 
and it's in a glass tube, obviously. And when I hook this up, electrons are going to move through. The light bulb in that fashion. So this here is a 9 volt battery and you can see that the voltmeter in the background is confirming that. What are we measuring here? We're measuring the battery's ability to take a charge and give it potential energy. So how much energy does it use? Well, I think it should be pretty obvious. It uses more energy if more electrons go. It uses less energy if less electrons go. So we don't really have a good answer to how much energy is that light bulb use. Depends how many electrons go. So it's a little bit like power, although the key thing in this case is not time, but it's amount of charge. So it would be really useful if we had a way of looking at energy in terms of not how much total energy you get, but how much energy each charge gets. So that's what the idea of voltage is, or electric potential. And I'm sure this is still a little bit fuzzy. So I want to take a step back from electricity and go into gravity. So you know the equation for gravitational potential energy. It's PE equals MGH. And I'm going to define something called gravitational potential. basically be potential energy divided by charge, or excuse me, by mass. We're doing gravity, not, not electricity. So what would that end up being? It would be mgh over m. So we get the obvious cancelization of mass. So we're just left with Gravitational potential is GH. Why is that useful? Well, let's look at this classroom. It's got a floor. It's got different heights. And I'm going to specifically care about H equals 1 meter. And H equals 2 meters. So I've got three textbooks, and I want to take a look at what their gravitational potential energy would be at these two heights. So we've got big, medium, and little. So let's take a look. My big textbook It's going to have a potential energy that equals its big mass times 9.8 times the height. Now the height and 9.8 are not going to change because I'm using the big book. I could do my medium book. potential energy would be its medium mass times g times the height. And I could do my little book. And its potential energy its little mass times 
So clearly these three guys are not going to have the same potential energy. And I think it's pretty obvious this guy's going to have a bigger one. Because the mass is bigger. This guy's will be medium. And this guy's will be small. And we can see that by dropping the books. If I drop this guy from a meter, I get a small bang. If I drop this guy from a meter, I get a medium bang. And if I drop this guy from a meter, I get a large bang. More of a thunk. But, although the energies in those collisions were different, part of the equation for calculating those energies was identical. The GH part. And we could see that in each case, the voltage or the gravitational potential was just 9.8 meters per second squared times one meter. And more importantly, if we go back to the definition of gravitational potential, we see that each kilogram of mass here arrived with the same amount of energy. The big book had more kilograms, so it supplied more energy. But inside it, each kilogram got the same energy in kinetic energy that each kilogram in the little book did. So that's so important, I want to write it. Each kilogram of mass got the same. the electric potential. It's just called V. And again, it's potential energy. But now we're dealing with, instead of mass, electricity, we use charge. So quantity of charge Q. And the reason this is important is that it tells us no matter how many charges flow through here, each of those charges arrives with a certain amount of energy. And that's what you need to make a device work. If a device requires low voltage, that means every electron going through it will need a relatively small amount of energy. If it requires high voltage, every electron going through it needs a lot of energy. Here I've got four D cells, which have a voltage of 1.5 volts each. So how does this represent more potential energy for charges, and therefore charges going around the circuit with more energy? Remember, electric potential or voltage is the energy per charge, the Coulomb of charge. Each of these has 1.5 volts. That means for every Coulomb of charge that is transferred, we get 1.5 joules. So let's use these ping pong balls to represent a Coulomb of charge. What would happen in a circuit? They start below the battery, and the battery actually raises them up, makes them have higher potential energy. That potential energy is then available to be released and used to do work, in that case to make the charge move. Each cell can contribute 1.5 joules per coulomb. And you can gang the cells together. If, for example, I use two cells, you can see I've given this charge more potential energy. Therefore, we expect it to be able to do more work. So that would be three volts, three joules per coulomb. This coulomb, we're going to pump up all three. Now it has 4.5 joules per so we can actually add potential energies together, potential energy per charge, to give our charges the potential energy we want. We never want to give them too much, though, because then they might damage the system. So the meter's confirming that this 9-volt battery is indeed giving us 9 joules per coulomb. Each of our charges is given 9 joules. 
and that means it's good for sending charge through with a certain amount of energy. And that amount of energy is really good for things like a smoke detector and certain types of radios. And that's why we use this kind of battery. We use other batteries when we require other amounts of energy per charge. And each device is set up to work with a certain amount of energy per electron. Now that's not what voltage is. Voltage is energy per coulomb. Coulomb is tr more than a trillion electrons, so it's potential energy per charge, but don't mix up a coulomb with an electron. But the bottom line is voltage is a measure of how much energy each charge has. If you don't give it the right amount of energy per charge, it won't work right. One final thing here. Um, sometimes people are surprised to hear that the Van de Graaff generator voltage of Van de Graaff, that it has about 500,000 volts that I'm willing to shock myself with here. I probably would not be willing to shock myself with wall current, which is in the U.S. 120 volts. Why? Why this and not that? It has to do with the ability of these two energy sources to make electrons move. So in the case of the Van de Graaff, if I rearrange this equation, I think we can see that energy equals the number of charges times the voltage. In the case of the Van de Graaff, even though voltage is really big, The number of charges is actually really small. And that makes the energy it delivers to me pretty small. So it can't hurt me. Wall current's a little bit different. It has a relatively small voltage, but it's capable of delivering a large number of charges. So it can deliver a lot more energy and therefore is a lot more dangerous. I hope that clears up the idea of voltage. If it's not totally clear yet, um, be aware this is one of the toughest concepts to get. But it just goes back to this idea. If we want an electronic device to work, charges have to go through it carrying a certain amount of energy. Voltage tells us how much energy there is.